Good evening and welcome to the Jay Duke Show. I'm in a brand new location tonight and very excited about that because we have a very, very special guest coming your way on the Jay Duke Show. Michael Matz is going to be joining us here in just a moment. And when I started this show, I never really thought we'd get guests like that we have on tonight. It's, it's just a privilege to be on with this gentleman. He's done so much for the horse industry in the past and still influencing so many people today. And it's, it's just such an honor and such a privilege to be having this chat. I would like to thank the Riders Boutique for joining us tonight and being our presenting sponsor. Um, check out Riders Boutique. They're a mobile equestrian store. Right now, they're at the National Horse Show, so you can go visit with them and see what they have. Riders Boutique has some wonderful products, Parlanti Boots, Butte Saddles, Horse Pilot, Cavalaria Toscano, Equifit, Escadron. They have all sorts of things for you to equip you and your horse in the very best equipment, so check them out. And I'd like to thank the Equivault.com. It's the world's largest library of online lessons out there. Um, everything from young horses to preparing for national finals, to preparing your Grand Prix horses, to gymnastics, to flat work. Check out the Equivault.com for all of your training needs. So we're going to bring on my guest tonight and Mr. Michael Matz, an American legend and a show jumping legend. Um, a horse racing legend. He, you know, if it comes to horses, there, there's nobody more. And um, we're going to talk about a few of his accomplishments here, but I had to cut it down to about 5% of really what was on Wikipedia because there was so much for him. So Michael's been a six time American champion, He's won the team gold medal at the 1986 World Championships, won the individual and team bronze medal at the 1978 World Equestrian Games. He was the winner of the World Cup Finals in 1981, won a four-time gold medalist at the Pan American Games, three-time Olympian and team silver medalist at Atlanta in 1996. And this is a really cool one. We're going to talk about this. He's picked to carry the American flag for the closing ceremonies of the 1996 in Atlanta. In, uh, Atlanta. And when he retired, he was the all-time leading money winner in show jumping in America. In 2006, he was inducted into the Show Jumping Hall of Fame. Mr. Matz, welcome to the Jay Duke Show. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for bringing with us. And where, where are you coming to us from tonight? I'm uh, at my house in uh, Coatesville, Pennsylvania. Nice, nice. Well, thank you so much for joining us. The, the wonders of the internet uh, bring us all together and we're gonna have viewers worldwide for this show this week. and. Uh, can't, can't wait for them all to meet you. So you have such a great history with horses um, and you've done so much. I want to talk about what the horse means to you, what, what, you know, what, what the horse has meant to you and personally in your lifetime. Well, Jay, it's meant a lot because uh, when I, when I was growing up, uh, I had no interest in horses whatsoever. I, uh, my father, was a plumber. I went to school the summers I worked for him. Uh, and it probably was when I was 16. Uh, I would work for him five days a week. And then on the weekdays, he had a friend who was a carpenter that I went to his place and uh, I cut his grass and uh, he ended up getting a couple horses for him and his wife to ride. And when he asked me if uh, I knew how to ride. I said, Oh, sure. <laughs> and, uh, when his wife didn't ride, I was just worried about keeping my job, not so much worried about the horses, but, uh, when one thing led to another, uh, I started riding the horses with him and, uh, you know, it, it went on from there and we did that for about two years, just going cross country and, things like that. And then he got me to join the pony club. And, okay. uh, I think I was the only unrated pony clubber, uh, that was able to drive a car. So, uh, it, it started late, but it worked out good in the end. Wow. That's, that's a very interesting start. And, and, you know, you, you, so you grew up, you didn't grow up like in a big program or anything like that. You just kind of grew up trail riding and in the yard, you know, learning about horses that way. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't have the formal education uh, at a younger age, but I think the fact that I was a little older when I did get uh, the education, uh, I was able to process it more. And uh, one thing led to another. Then uh, I went 
at the Pony Club, and when I graduated from high school, uh, I got a job as a groom working for Bernie Traurig. Okay, okay. Well, Ber wow, that's well. Bernie's been a wonderful horseman as well. So, so you were grooming for him, and then did uh, how did the competition part of your career begin? Well, I worked for Bernie, and, and it really wasn't. Uh, Bernie was still competing very, you know, uh, vigorously at that point, and I. I you know, I was probably about, and it ended up that all I did was, uh, he, he had, uh, almost 50 some horses at his barn. So it ended up that, uh, all I was doing was feeding the horses, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, watering the horses and doing all the work like that. And, uh, then he started giving me a couple horses that I could ride in the evening. And there was, a uh, and one of his riders was a guy named Charlie Twasco, and he was inspiring to go ride on the team and stuff like that. So I'd watch him a lot, and uh, and Bernie obviously was, uh, you know, is a good rider. So uh, I only worked there for about six or eight months. That's all. So uh, I. I Basically, all I was doing was stable management and riding when I could. But he did let me show a couple of horses at some local shows. So that was a little bit uh, a nice situation. And then from there, uh, I went to work for uh, Vince Dugan in his, uh, he had a sales barn in Westchester. And one thing led to another. I got to ride a lot of horses there. And Vince helped me a lot. And uh, then... Uh, Jerry Baker asked if uh, he was losing his rider and he had a string for Mr. Ward at that time and they would just go and show and uh, he asked me if I, a lot of the horses were getting a little old at that time, but uh, uh, he asked me if I was interested in the uh, uh, the position and uh, then I started with Mr. Ward and then in 1974 is when the first time I rode on the team. Okay. Wow. That's, that's amazing to know the history there of how that all started with, when, when was there, was there a moment when you thought, you know, I really want to make this my life and this is, you know, horses are going to be my life. And, and I just, this is how I see my future. Was there a, a flash moment? No, Jay, I, I would say, uh, uh, you know, I enjoyed what I was doing when I was working with Bernie. I, I, there was no, you know, I, I would see all these other people riding and say, you know, I think I can do that just as good as they can, but what's the difference? They have the horses and I don't. So I had to try to find a way to get those horses. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, when I was with Vince, uh, we, there was a lot of situations where I did get to show a lot of the sale horses quite a bit. So I got to ride a lot of different horses. Right. and meet a lot of different people. And Vince gave me the opportunity to, uh, to show at the local shows. And uh, one year we were in Florida and Vince got hurt. Uh, he got a concussion, I believe it was, or something that he couldn't ride. And he let me ride some of the horses. So some people got to see me ride some horses at that point. And uh, this is when, uh, like I say, Jerry Baker noticed that uh, – you know, I was riding and then, uh, when he needed a rider to do full time, uh, you know, I, I was lucky enough to get that position. Wow. That that's great. Great story to hear that. What do you feel? You know, you've been so successful throughout your career then, you know, as, as a rider and as a trainer and, you know, with show jumping and of course into racehorses, what, what's something about your character do you feel that has made you so successful in your career with, with these wonderful animals? What, you know, what set you apart and, and created the success you've had? Well, I, I think in any business, no matter what, what it is, you, you, you have to be uh, sort of determined and willing to put the work in. Nothing came easy. Uh, and, and it did, if it did come easy, it didn't last. So I, I, I think, uh, like I said, I, I went from graduating from high school, going to uh, Bernie Traurig's grooming, learning a lot about, you know, the horsemanship, about feeding, uh, things like that. When, when I was at Bernie's, he had uh, that horse that was a very good horse that Neil Shapiro rode called Sloopy. 
and uh, he was a very difficult horse to be around. And uh, but some of the methods I didn't agree with, but he turned out to be a good horse. Uh, so and I fed a lot of horses, uh, and I, I learned it from the the bottom up about what it took to take care of a horse. Uh, when I went to Vince's, uh, here we were, you know, had a stable of 40 horses and uh, every morning everybody mucked out the stalls. We got them done. We got a customer to come in and look at horses. I was on one horse after another horse after another horse. And uh, I must say, I really had a good time there. <laughs> Not that it was, <laughs> I was gonna, I said, this is my lifestyle, what I was gonna be, but uh, Vince was great to work for. Uh, a lot of the things I didn't, now when I look back at it, I sort of didn't agree with, but I met a lot of nice friends. Vince taught me a lot in different ways. So I, I think I, one of the things was I've tried to take a little bit from everybody and find the best attributes I could and tried them to apply that when I would go on to a different situation. Yes. Yeah. And I, I've actually heard you say that before at some point in the past. And I think that's just such great advice for everybody and for all the viewers watching too, you know, and, and what you're saying is you, you learn from these, these horsemen and you learn kind of what to do and what not to do and, and you take it and make it your own. And that's, you know, that is how you become well-rounded and, and you get so much knowledge. And so that's, that's a great lesson, I think, for everybody watching, especially. And, and I think one of the things is Jay, that he, whether you agree with it, whether it's right or wrong, uh, there's a lot of different ways to get from A to B. And uh, sometimes what works in one horse won't work on another horse. And uh, usually they try to tell you, you just have to listen. Yes. Yeah, that, that's great. <laughs> that, that, there you go. That's the best advice we're going to get for sure. So you've had so many career highlights um, and I wouldn't want to know where to start, but what I want to personally know was what did it feel like in 1996, the Atlanta Olympic games, you were picked to carry in the American flag at the closing ceremonies, which, you know, when it comes to being honored with something that's, that's about as great as it gets. Um, what, what did it feel like when, when you were told that? And then what did it feel like to walk into that stadium? Well, uh, you know how the process works where you have your team president, your team captain, and that was Robert Dover. And they all met and they pick you uh, who they're going to nominate to carry the flag, each discipline. Well, he went to opening ceremonies and uh, they picked me as the person they were going to nominate to carry the flag. I don't know that they picked me because maybe I was the oldest one on the team. I don't know, but they picked me and, uh, it was a great time because uh, here we are at our home country. Uh, we went there and uh, w there was a lot of people there. And uh, so Robert went to the, the first meeting and he said, uh, well, we'll see what we can do. And he came back and he said, well, you didn't get to carry the flag in opening ceremonies. And I thought I was going to get you to take the oath, but, uh, Bruce Baumgartner was the wrestler. He, he was a white male. And uh, they said they didn't want a white male taking the oath. So they picked Teresa Edwards, who was a black female. And uh, so he said, but don't worry. He said that you'll carry the flag in closing ceremonies. So I didn't think anything of it. We did the competitions. We ended up winning the silver medal. And uh, my wife had a, a, she rented a house down there for it. And, it actually worked out great because the team after just about every night came over there for dinner and she was, I don't know, seven or eight months pregnant at the time, but she had something to eat for everybody dinner. So it was a great gathering spot for us yeah. all after the competitions. And uh, we came back and uh, we were staying, the phone rings and Robert called up and he said, you're carrying the flag in the closing ceremonies. So I said, Robert, I said, uh, what happened? He said, well, I'm not going to tell you what I said, but I'm going to tell you the girl that the last person that got up was the person for track and field for their discipline. And, uh, 
they were before they voted, he was the last one. And we thought maybe Michael Johnson, who did so well in, in the running, the gymnasts did so well and everything like that. So uh, he said, well, he said, this guy's been here from 1976 to 1996. He says, he's not going to last much longer. <laughs> vote for him. And before he even made, he nominated anybody, they had a vote. And I received every vote except one. And some girl voted for herself, which is fine. But uh, that's all he said. So uh, it ended up that I got to carry the flag. Wow. And, and, and like you said, to do that, you know, in your home country, to walk to the stadium, you know, and that Olympics was, was such a huge Olympics with amazing crowds and that amazing stadium there that uh, what, a, what a thrill for you. That's congratulations on that. Well, I mean, and there was, there's so many situations. Uh, when I went to Atlanta on the plane, uh, I was sitting aside of a girl and uh, I said to her, I said, are you going to the Olympics? He says, yeah, I, I, I work for NBC. I said, oh, great. I said, uh, he said, she said, what about you? I said, yeah, I'm going too." I said, good. And then when they found out I was carrying the flag and I was from their hometown, there was the girl with the camera holding. And she said, why didn't you tell me you were going to be competing in the Olympics? I said, well, you didn't ask me. <laughs> a lot of nice things that, that happened at, uh, we came home that eve, you know, after the Olympics and my wife and I, and, we lived at a different place and it was even more in the country than this was. And they, they had a big sign up over the trees to our house, you know, congratulations and stuff like that. So it was a, a lot of nice things that happened. Yeah. That's, that's so special. So let's transition to the show jumping arena. Um, you, you know, we, we went through a few of your amazing accomplishments. Is there something that really stands out that, you know, a certain class or a certain victory or just a certain moment in the ring that uh, you look back and, and recall fondly? Well, I, I think one of the things was the world championships in uh, uh, 1970, uh, was it, or 80, I don't even remember the times at Aachen we had. And uh, we kind of went over there and it was uh, Conrad Holmfeld, myself, uh, Katie Monahan and uh, uh, who else was it? She had the natural. Uh, uh, anyway, we she was the most inexperienced uh, rider, Catherine Bertzel. Oh, Catherine Bertzel on the natural, the the beautiful brown yeah. yes. yes. And that was the like the most expensive bought, uh, horse bought, and it was it was kind of a funny group but we all kind of got together and Catherine had maybe the best horse, but the least experienced. Katie was very experienced and Conrad was very experienced and maybe we didn't have horses as good as they did, but it worked out that, uh, you know, one really complimented the other. So uh, that was a, a, a highlight, I would say, you know, of my career that, in the beginning, I thought that maybe this team was kind of a funny situation because the way it was, but everybody really got along well and everybody did their part. So I, I think that's part of the, the team situation when that can happen. And I think good results can come for it. I remember I was on teams that you thought, boy, we're loaded with the, uh, you know, experience, talent, everything like that, but it just didn't mesh. And uh, so you know, things go from there. And Lisa Turnipole was, uh, was the alternate and she couldn't have been greater with everybody about it. Sometimes, you know, you get one person on there that's a, uh, or Lisa DeLaurier now, but she was the, the alternate. And uh, sometimes you get somebody that's disgruntled and said, well, I should be there instead of this one, but she couldn't have been more supportive and it, and it just worked out well for everybody. And that does help. It's interesting with Nations Cups because so many people look at this sport, you know, as an individual sport and they just think, well, you know, it's four individuals going in there and putting up a score. And so much of team success in the Nations Cups is about that support, that teamwork, the camaraderie of people working together. And I think that I guess unless you've done it at that level, it's hard to for other people to understand. But it certainly is a key to success. And America's had wonderful success in the show jumping ring um, in Nations Cups. And I think 
and still today, the teamwork in the United States amongst the, the elite riders is, is amazing. And that's been a big part of their success. Now, you had a really special horse. Um, uh, you've had very many special horses, but Jet Run was a very, very special horse. Um, we, I think we have a picture of you with, with that one. And, and as we can see here for everyone watching too, classic American style. Um, you know, you're, you're never gonna watch a more classical rider than Michael Matz in the ring. Can you tell us a little bit about Jet Run and, and how that went with, with this wonderful animal? Well, uh, uh, Fernando Sunderes, uh, who's uh, had him on the Mexican team, was uh, used to own the horse. And we had the horse, uh, when the horse was in the United States, it used to stay at uh, Mr. Dixon's stable, who I worked for, and Jerry Baker also worked for him. So. Uh, Fernando used to come up and ride the horse and I would ride the horse all the time for him in between. And when he would come to the shows, uh, cause he was working in his father's business, uh, he would come, come up and, and now that I think of it, uh, him and his wife, we stayed, I, I had a, a one bedroom apartment and we pulled out the couch and him and his wife slept in the couch. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it worked at that time. And, uh, He's a great guy, and 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 there, he got up one day, and we were having a cup of coffee, and he said, "Michael, I think I'm going to go into a business with my father, and I'm not going to have time for this horse. I'd like you to have this horse. Uh, this is the amount of money I want for him, and if you cannot get somebody to buy him for him, I'm going to go and ask." And he had a list of people he had it thought out very well, and. Uh, we showed it to Jerry the next day and Jerry and I went up to Mr. Dixon and uh, we sat there and talked and he said, uh, uh huh. And everything we told him, we had, this is probably one of the best horses in the world and everything like that. And he goes, well, I don't know what to say, but it just sounds to me like we just have to have him. <laughs> and, uh, and that time, the price was three hundred thousand dollars, and probably now you can't buy a preliminary jumper for that. But uh, you know, at that time, it was very uh, uh, no, it was two hundred fifty thousand. Excuse me, that's what it was, and uh, and that Fernando said, "This is what I paid for him, and I'd like to offer him for you at that that price." Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, "I think I'd have to. Uh, we just have to have him, but it's up to Mrs. D. And that was Mrs. Dixon." So. He made a phone call to Mrs. Dixon and they called us back a couple hours later and said they bought him. Wow. So that, that was the start of that. And Mr. Dixon was a great supporter and Mrs. Dixon still is a great supporter in the racehorses that I have. So they were great people and uh, I, uh, I can't thank them enough for giving me the opportunity to ride a horse like that. But, you know, one thing, and actually, Jay, uh, it wasn't a week later that I was riding the horse and uh, I had him out by the barn or anything like that. A trash truck came and, and was putting the trash in and uh, he threw his head up and hit me right in the nose and broke my nose and I had two black eyes. <laughs> and uh, we went to the Pan American Games. Uh, I was going to the Pan, Pan, Pan American Games from there with two black eyes and my jaw wired shut. So it was, uh, it was a, it was a different situation. So, uh, yeah, that would have been good for your photo ID picture. Exactly. <laughs> I looked like a raccoon. <laughs> so there's with teaching, um, you know, so many people talk about the influence that you've had on them and, you know, it's very interesting, you know, you are inarguably in the top five riders of all time in, in the history of the world as far as show jumping goes in any conversation that people would have. Many people, though, can't transfer that over to, to coaching and, to, and teaching others. And um, I, my brief encounter with you was a clinic I did when I was 19 years old. And, and I recall it so clearly because you, I was riding a thoroughbred and I'd only ever ridden thoroughbreds at that point in my lifetime. And you taught me how to connect a horse from behind and, and, and you know, ride from leg to hand and, and connect them correctly in the bridle, which I never really knew how to do. I just did rent their breads and, you know, you just sit up there and you kick and go and they jump amazing. 
And I still, to this day, teach that same technique that you you showed me and how, how you taught me feel because, you know, learning feel is such a difficult thing for so many riders. And, and I really attribute that clinic as part of my development. So many other people have similar stories about you. What, you know, Candace King last week was talking about what a great influence you were on her career. Um, you know, Luger Beerbaum today was talking about what a great influence you were on his career. What is it that you, that separates you that you've been able to, here, here's a quote from Luger that people can see. What is it that you've been able to show people with riding? Because so many wonderfully talented riders can, can't seem to communicate that to others. And yet you can do that. How, how, do, how do you do that? Well, I mean, I, I think one of the, the big things is, uh, and which I've noticed today a little bit more, when I started to go to the racehorses, uh, I didn't want to find myself just teaching all the time and stuff. I wanted to still work with the horses. And then I, I, I've been training racehorses now for almost uh, 20 some years. Uh, and I do like working with uh, my children and I'm helping some other people right now also. But uh, I, I did think it maybe might be a little bit selfish of myself that uh, Bert and Emothy taught me so much. And I just said to myself, uh, and I see a lot of the people riding right now, Jay, with the, and, and they, and they just get a good horse and that's the answer. But how long does it really last? And, um, uh, if they know a little bit about the, the foundation and the basics and say how to make it last a little bit longer, uh, I, I think it's a good situation where they have a good foundation and they can continue with it. Uh, and right now I found that helping some of these younger kids, I mean, uh, I was very proud of my son. He has a, a horse that he had in the amateur division and he just, now he's got him and he's jumping in the bigger classes and he did quite well down in Tryon two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And, uh, but here's, you know, I don't know how many years that he put into getting this horse to have a good foundation. And now he's finally there. And, uh, you know, it's, it's gratifying to me to see that happen. And just what you said, it's gratifying to me to hear that it's something that a clinic we gave a long time ago is something that Bert and Emothy taught me and Jerry Baker and working on the flat can go on to you. And if I can do that to other people, then it can just expand what you and other people will tell that I've helped to, to other people the same way uh, Bert and Emothy and Jerry Baker did to me. Wow. That's, thank you for sharing that. That, that really is, uh, is incredible. Um, and, you, and still today you are working with people. Um, we had uh, about a month ago or so, uh, Lucy Delorier was on the show with her father, Mario, and um, they had wonderful things to say about you and that you're um, hang out at their farm sometimes and, and help her. And she's talking about the influence. So, I mean, you are still, even though, you know, racehorses is, is, you know, you're kind of your primary focus today, um, still very involved in the show jumping world. Yeah. And I, and, and I would say Jay, in the last year, I've got even involved a little bit more because I'm, I'm cutting down a little bit with the racehorses and uh, uh, it gives me time my wife does a lot with the children here and uh, I help them also a bit. And there's a couple other people I've been helping. Mario, I helped when he was 19 years old. His father called me up and asked me if he could help me with Aramis. And uh, <laughs> I said, okay. And, uh, but Mario wanted to go from the preliminary jumpers as a five or six year old to the Grand Prix in two weeks. And, <laughs> He I, said that, yes. <laughs> I said, you got to slow down a little bit. Well, he didn't like to hear that, mm -hmm. but he ended up to have a wonderful career and he's doing well now. And he asked me a, a, a couple of years ago at, when he was down in Florida, if I could just be there and watch a little bit, if I can give him something to work with and stuff like that. And uh, sometimes we all need somebody to give us a, a second opinion or uh, just go back over, look, look over your shoulder and say, I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't do that. I don't think it's necessary. Uh, just a little different point of view. And uh, I 
just watched him ride and try on last uh, Saturday, and uh, he had two wonderful rounds. I mean, it uh, you, you couldn't ask for anybody to ride any better and, and the horse to jump any better. So that's gratifying to me to see whether uh, there's anything that I that he felt could help him or not. But uh, some of the things that we worked over the winter with those horses, you know, maybe not this summer, but last year and the year before, it looks like it's paying off now. Right. That that. So you really, with horses, it, it sounds like you know you really have a long term plan. You know, with each everyone to build that foundation, to work on the basics. To, I like to talk about it as like building a wall and filling in the gaps and 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 slowly building that wall up and up so everything is solid with their basics. Um, and it sounds like that's definitely your your approach to training. Is that would that be correct? Yeah, I mean, I I, I think even uh, as I training the racehorses, I don't usually have a horse that uh, comes out of the gate the first time and just being you know the superstar. Uh, you always have the exceptional, like a horse called Barbaro, who was an exceptional horse, uh, but uh, that's ability uh, by himself, but. You know, when I was first starting and just like you were talking about when we gave the clinic, uh, I remember every day going up to Gladstone and coming out and riding, Bert saying to do this and that, go forward, collect, go forward. And I said, oh, boy, what? I don't know what he means. Am I ever going to get this? And then one day I got the feeling where when I said when he said to go forward and the horse was light as a feather and came back and he was light as a feather and I only had it for five seconds, but it was that five seconds that I kept looking for 10, 15, 20, you know, uh, and, and the whole career to keep him going that way. And it's, it's uh, something that, uh, you know, it's to work for the, and obviously if the horse does that, the horse is going to last longer and the prices of horses today, they shouldn't be a one shot deal and go in and go back out. So, uh, it, it, it's, it's something that I think that's, you know, and, you know, the horse will tell you when he's, you know, he's going well, what he accepts. So it's just, it's an interesting th situation for me to try to figure out the horse and the rider with it. And, uh, you know, sometimes people don't like to hear what you say, but they have to realize what it is and try to make it work. What would you say, you know, you, you know, you've had the success. We talk, obviously, Barbara, you know, you had a Kentucky Derby winner. You've had a Belmont Stakes winner. Um, so you've been, you know, a super successful show uh, uh, racehorse trainer as well as a show jumping trainer. What would you say horsemanship is, is the, some of the differences or that maybe the biggest difference between what you see at the racetrack and what you see in the show jumping world and, is there something for show jumpers to, to learn from the horse racing world as far as horsemanship? Well, I, I think at least I have some hair right now, Jay. Uh, some of the horsemanship is absolutely <laughs> horrendous when I see the riding and stuff like that. And it, it's, uh, it can be, and that there's, there's people that are just, it, it's a different feeling for it. Uh, the assistant that I had, uh, uh, Peter Brett with Barbaro, he was, uh, you know, he was a champion jockey in, in, in Dubai. Uh, he, he was a good horseman. And uh, like I said, he worked for me 15 years and uh, I can't say enough praise about him. He, uh, it's just a different feeling, but horsemanship is horsemanship, whether you're doing a, a cutting horse, a reining horse, uh, a show jumper, a steeplechase, and you, you find out the the good trainers are the ones that, uh, you know, can make different horses do well. There's always, you know, a good horse is dangerous in anybody's hands. But to have a couple of them it is a, a different situation. So, uh, and a lot of things, you know, good horses make good riders and good horses make good trainers. So this is one of the things that, uh, you know, a lot of it is sort of just and the same thing with show jumping and the same as racing i i, I heard a, a comment one time where i think it was eddie arcaro said uh, when they said about one person that rides a horse better than the other and he said which person hinders the horse the least mm -hmm. and if you think about that it can really pertain to show jumping also 
Yes. And uh, it's, it's a nice, it's an interesting uh, quote coming from a jockey about whether he fit it better than somebody else. But when you see one person rides this type of horse, one person rides that type of horse. And when you really look at it, which horse, which rider doesn't bother the horse when he's jumping, when he's reining, when he's cutting cattle, racing, you know, th those are the things that a lot of things pertain to uh, what, you know, are common themes with the horse. Right. Thank you so much for, for sharing this, this wisdom with us um, because it, it's, it's so, so true and so spot on and, and certainly everyone out there that loves horses, um, you know, can relate to it and, and learn from it. So I have a question for you. And I, I ask this of many of my, you know, we have superstar guests on this show and, and I, I, I like hearing the answer to this, but, and if I didn't ask you this question, I know my viewers would be um, forever angry at me. Your favorite horse of all time, and not one that you rode. So this can't be a horse that, that, that you can, yourself competed with, but if you could ride one horse, past or present, which horse is that? Well, I mean, uh, oh, that's a hard one. I mean, I, I <laughs> when it, it would be a little easier if you said about just horses I rode. Uh, <laughs> yes, and you rode some great ones, but if there's just a horse that stands out you know, obviously you've seen some the, all the very best horses in the, in the history of show jumping, but is there a horse that stands out that said, geez, that that's, if there was one horse I could just grab and, and sit on for one class, that would be it. Um, is there a horse that stands out? Yeah, I, I don't know that I could duplicate a lot of these riders, what they're, they're doing with the horses. Uh, I remember I, when I rode uh, Boomerang in the, uh, what the changing and stuff like he was very lovely to ride and i didn't think he would be in a hackamore and the way he kind of racked like that but he was a nice horse to ride at the fences uh now yeah, big was, strong horse boomerang was a big strong horse and um and actually if one of my upcoming guests is mr eddie mackin from ireland so um, and he was nice to ride i yeah. said he was probably the nicest of the horses that i rode in that final grouping of four uh the other one uh roman was very strong and that horse of uh johan heinz's was really strong at least for me anyway but uh you know I, I i don't know i mean i i think uh you know i think jet run was probably and i know eddie told me he was the worst feeling horse when he rode him because he didn't jump very well for eddie but uh and uh I'd say he probably was the best horse we had. One of the horses that, that I did ride, that I loved to ride, was a horse called Rum Four. Uh, he was very fast and won a lot of classes. He didn't have the scope as a, a Heisman or, or a chef or something like that, but uh, he was very, uh, you know, you knew if you got into the jump off, you could really go flat out and he would be careful on him. But, uh, you know, obviously, Jem Twist looked like a real good horse to ride. I mean, he was fun to watch, and Gre Greg and Leslie rode him real well, and he looked like a, a, a super horse to ride. So that would probably be one horse that I said it was a a, a real real good horse. Uh, yeah, that would be. He's definitely the the number one pick um, for for people. Jem Twist and. You know, such, such an American legend, such a world worldwide legend. Of a yeah, world. I mean, it, he 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 just jumped. Uh, but he was kind of a funny horse too. It all started out. I mean, everybody said, "Oh, he's a nice preliminary horse, but he's not going to go further than there." And he's a nice intermediate horse. He's going, and he just kept blossoming all the time. And uh, you know, it looked like there was no no end to what he could jump. I don't think there was. <laughs> they they couldn't yeah. build a course too big for for that yeah. one. No, it's it's true. He was a he was a wonderful horse. Yes. Well, Mike, uh, Michael, thank you so much. This has just been such a treat um, to have you on the show and um, imparting your wisdom to to all of us. And and you know, we could take we could take this episode and turn it into a learning tool for people. You know, the wisdom that you have to to share with everyone. And congratulations on such a wonderful career. And and best of luck 
um, in, in your in your future, whether you know be with the racehorses or the show jumping or wherever it is. I know that it will be very successful. And uh, thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome, Jay. Thank you. I want to um, let everyone know next week we have a very special guest again. World champion Gail Greeno is going to be on the show. She had a great horse named Mr. T, wonderful Canadian friend of mine. So really looking forward to that. Um, also an upcoming guest, we secured this today, Luger Beerbaum is going to be on the show. So the, the lineup is just getting, it's, it's incredible, the, the guests that we're getting. And I'm very excited about that. Thank you so much for everyone for watching. Um, I want to thank Riders Boutique for everything that you've done for tonight to make it happen. Um, for Christmas shopping, check them out. They've got a great online store. And uh, they're at the National Horse Show right now. You're going to see them at pretty much all the shows with their mobile tax shop. It's, it's one of the best mobile tax shops out there. So please check out Riders Boutique, um, theequivault.com. As always, they are the best site to go to for training your horses. I want to thank Carly Sparks and Horse Network. Does the best job. Um, it's such a privilege to be doing this show and working with Carly. She's, she's a wonderful, wonderful person. Horse Network is, is a great, great company. And we'll close it out by saying ride safely and always respect the horse. Good night, everybody.